Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome. Welcome to the Clinton Historical Society Zoom program in honor of Black History Month. We have a hybrid program tonight. One of um, the first part of it will be a film on the Tuskegee Airmen, and then we'll have two speakers who will be introduced um, later um, by our program chair, Barbara Sweet. But my name is Cynthia Cook, and I'm now the president of the Clinton Historical Society. But for about 11 years, I was the director of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum here in Hyde Park. And during that time, one of, one of the projects that I most enjoyed was the production of the film that you're going to see tonight. Um, it's called Red-Tailed Angels, the Story of the Tuskegee Airmen. And it was the first production to come out of our newly revitalized Pere Lorenz Film Center. Pere Lorenz was a documentary filmmaker, some say America's first documentary filmmaker. He worked for the Farm Security Administration. FDR called him my filmmaker. And um, as a member of the New Deal, he was um, involved in helping to get the word out to most of America about the terrible problems of the Dust Bowl and the problems of agricultural areas in our country. And one of the things he did was make two really well-known documentaries. One was called The River, which told the story of soil erosion throughout the Mississippi River Valley, a major contributor to the Dust Bowl. And another was called The Plow That Broke the Plains, which also told of the removal of the topsoil by the um, um, by the plows, the massive um, agricultural equipment that was coming in there and breaking up the topsoil and breaking up the grasslands, again, contributing to the soil um, erosion and the dust bowls of the 1930s. But anyway, when um, Per Lorenz died in 1992, his widow, Elizabeth Mayer Lorenz, set up an endowment in his name to make educational films um, through the Roosevelt Library. And um, in, 19, in 2005, we replaced the film equipment with video equipment. And the film you're going to see tonight is the very first one that was done out of our new production facilities. It still goes on producing educational videos um, for students and the public. The um, story of the Red-Tailed Angels is a fascinating one. And I hope you enjoy it. I hope you also enjoy listening to this really unique soundtrack, which also um, has on has features some of the music of an, a legendary jazz man and songwriter of the 1930s and 40s. His name was Josh White Sr. And um, it's 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 some great music, and it's perfect to go with um, the soundtrack to this film. We, some of the men that you will see, and I think all of the men who are featured in this um, have now passed away. But we had a talented filmmaker, Cara DeVito, who traveled down and interviewed them during one of their, one of their reunions in Tuskegee, Alabama. And I think she caught some remarkable footage, which is a testimony, not only to some of the worst stories of racism in America, but also sort of the enduring um, patriotism and enduring hope and enduring vision of these um, famous men, the Tuskegee Airmen. And so without further ado, we're going to go right to the film. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Everybody flying but a Negro like me, Uncle Sam said. Your face is on the ground. When I fly my airplanes, don't want no Negro round. 
My name is Charles Walter Dryden. My mother used to tell me that before I could talk, I used to take bits of paper and throw them in the air and try to say airplane, airplane. So I came into this world with a strong desire to fly. My time to go. When I got to the army, found the same old Jim Crow, Uncle Sam said. I'm Herbert E. Carter. I was born in Amory, Mississippi, September 27, 1919. I'm 85 years old. I was about 19 when I started my pilot training at Tuskegee. If you ask me, I think democracy is fine. I mean democracy without the color line, Uncle Sam said. Well, the war clouds were, were brewing when I was in a uh, sophomore in college. So I enlisted, even though I didn't like this country at that time. I hated this country because of the way it was treating us. And I felt that, you know, it's still my country, however. So I'm going to try and help defend it. In 1925, the Army War College completed a three-year study of the performance of black soldiers in World War I came to some rather ridiculous conclusions. They studied the mental, moral, physical, and psychological characteristics of the Negro and came to the conclusions that Negroes are a subspecies of the human family. This became the preponderant attitude toward Negroes as far as anything technical, anything requiring uh, patriotism, loyalty, integrity, responsibility. Integrity, responsibility. The Tuskegee Airmen proved the war college study wrong during World War II. They demonstrated that African Americans had these qualities in abundance. March 31st, 1945. 45 Tuskegee Airmen, flying the most sophisticated planes available, Mustang P-51s with bright red painted tails, escort and defend with their lives bomber pilots executing an American bombing mission over Austria. At the end of the mission, they destroyed 12 German aircraft. The airmen were so good at protecting our bombers that the bomber pilots called them the red-tailed angels, often not knowing that these angels were black. We kind of roll around them and we would form a defensive perimeter around the, the uh, bombers. So nobody could get through without shooting us down first. Colonel Davis, he said, your mission is to protect those bombers. Stay with them. And when the interceptors come, be there to protect them. And I do not want any of the 332nd chasing after aircraft for personal victories. It was this exacting discipline, demanded by the squadron's iron-willed commander, Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., the second black man ever to graduate from West Point, that led the Tuskegee Airmen to become extraordinary pilots who never lost a single bomber plane they were protecting. The story of the Tuskegee Airmen is a relatively unknown one in American history. Yet, it is a large and important chapter in the fight against racism in the United States. There was a general stereotyping attitude in America 
that was very racist. And it said if you were a Negro, you didn't have the agility, the dexterity, or the ability to operate complicated equipment. And so far as the military were, was concerned, you were only suitable for fatigue type duties, mess attendant, truck drivers, but no technical training or uh, services. And this was very degrading and very dehumanizing. Like much of America, the armed forces were segregated and the majority of blacks in World War II did menial work. My brother and I tried to get in the Navy. At that time, blacks could only get in the Navy as messmen or uh, the black crew shoving the coal in the, into the engines. You could get in there and uh, you could advance to a certain rank, but that's as high as you could go. And I went in and told the uh, recruiting sergeant that uh, I wanted to apply for the aviation cadet program. He was astonished and he looked and he says, there ain't no niggas flying no airplanes. Boy, you must be crazy. Get out of here. Fortunately, Black America also had friends. One of them was First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. In 1941, she met Charles Alfred Anderson, one of America's first Black pilots. He had to teach himself to fly because no white pilot would. In those days, it was 100% segregation. And uh, they just point blank tell you that if we don't take colored people out, no, we don't take you out. Mrs. Roosevelt met Chief Anderson, as he was affectionately called, at the Tuskegee Institute, a college for ex-slaves that had been founded in Alabama in the years following the Civil War. Chief Anderson had not only taught himself to fly, but was credentialed to teach others. He was training pilots when the First Lady noticed him. First thing she said when I was introduced to her was that I always heard that colored people couldn't fly airplanes. When I see you flying all around here, I said, oh yes, Mrs. Roosevelt, we've been flying for quite a while. So then she decided she's gonna take a ride with me. I don't know if I asked her doing that, I'm not sure. She said, I'm gonna take a flight with you. And then everybody got all upset about it. And you know, people who were with her and whatnot. No, Mrs. Roosevelt, you can't do that. But she was a woman who was very determined to do whatever she wanted to do. So she said, come on, let's go. She came, she, we went over and got an airplane. So when it came down, she said, well, it's even fly all right. The wife of the president flying with a black pilot? Mrs. Roosevelt knew the value of this picture. This was her way of supporting black Americans. While Franklin Roosevelt agreed with Mrs. Roosevelt's belief in equal treatment for African Americans, as president, he had to govern a nation that was deeply racist, particularly the Southern Democrats in his own party. He had to maintain a good working relationship with Congress to ensure wartime so let's say you have to read an incredibly long email from your boss that you have to finish before the big meeting starts in 10 minutes. Mm. Or you're cramming for an exam the night before, but can't bear to keep your eyes open to read one more textbook chapter. Or you're reviewing a dense legal document that could change your life forever. Or you're proofreading your thesis one last time before you submit it to make sure there aren't any any errors. No matter what you have to read, we could all use a second pair of eyes to help us retain information and put our best foot forward. Enter Speechify, a reading assistant powered by artificial intelligence and deep learning and designed consciously for students and working professionals who want to get more done. Speechify does the reading for you, so you can spend less energy reading and more energy comprehending. Choose your listening speed. Start at 230 words per minute and build to 500 words per minute, which is 2.5 times faster than most people read. Choose from a range of incredible voices that use human inflection, so you can stay engaged without getting tired. Don't have enough time to finish. Take your reading on the go with a single click. Best of all, Speechify is free. Click on the button to download now.
maritime policies essential to winning the war. This often meant avoiding controversial issues that would antagonize Southern congressmen, such as equality for blacks. Went to the deep and factory Trying to find some word to do Had a nerve to tell me, black boy Nothing here for you I'll tell you, brother Well, it sure don't make no sense when a Negro can't work in the national defense. Hier Truppentransportschiffe bei der Einfahrt in den kleinen Welt. Yet World War II provided FDR with opportunities to take action without having to go to Congress. Using the executive order, he declared an end to discriminatory practices that hurt the overall war effort. FDR prohibited discrimination in the defense industry, created the Fair Employment Practices Commission, and the Roosevelt administration authorized the creation of the all-black air squadron at Tuskegee. He also would appoint an unprecedented number of black Americans to important government positions. Such steps would lay the foundation for the eventual integration of the military and help prepare the way for the civil rights movement that followed the war. After December 7, 1941, it's when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. We at war and our government's telling uh, one-tenth of its population that they don't want their services in that capacity. You can serve as we see you fit to serve. And the black press uh, spearheaded a drive and the Roosevelt administration announced in March of 1941 that they were going to activate a black pursuit squadron, the 99th. Here for the first time, Negro aviation cadets were being groomed to fly war planes of a unit which was then a unit in Fort only, the 99th pursuit squadron and that here in Alabama, because of the good flying weather, some 350 days a year they computed, they were gonna build a field near Tuskegee, spend $1.5 million and build a field to train these black cadets. In the land of the free, call the home, home of the brave. All I want is liberty, that is what I crave. Some of them said, well, it's impossible. They're not going to be able to fly. But we'll have an experimental program at Tuskegee to prove one way or another, but mostly that it won't work. And that's why we call it the Tuskegee Experiment. Traveling to a training base below the Mason-Dixon line was clearly daunting to the black men reared in the cosmopolitan cities of the North. My first exposure to Jim Crow was on the train because it was only colored coach, all colored, and it was a car behind the baggage car, which was behind the coal, the coal engine. There was no air conditioning, so it was hot, very hot. And to get some air, you open the windows, and the soot just came in constantly. We went into this store. It was like a general grocery store. It was small. And we started collecting the things that we wanted to buy. All of a sudden, the store owner comes out from behind the curtain, and he said, I don't sell to niggas. Get out of here, or I'll call the police. That kind of thing. Despite a continuous barrage of racist incidents, the Tuskegee Airmen began a demanding training process in March of 1941. One year later, in the summer of 1942, the 99th Pursuit Squadron 
was finished training and ready for combat. But no military commanders would accept them. So, for another year, the Tuskegee Airmen remained in Alabama, training and, well, retraining. We trained them and they can fly, but we're not, we don't, the commanders in the Pacific, the commanders in Europe didn't want any part of it. They thought we'd be in a way. So Arnold was at one point contemplating sending us thousands of miles from any combat area. So that's how desperate they were just to shut us to the side. Finally, in 1943, the Tuskegee Airmen went on active duty in North Africa. They soon found out that even in war, segregation was enforced. The airmen brought with them black mechanics, air traffic controllers, and even black doctors. Still, resistance to the black pilots within the military did not let up. Their immediate supervisor, Colonel William Spike Molmeyer, wrote a report about the 99th, stating, they have failed to display the aggressiveness and desire for combat that are necessary to a first-class fighting organization. The Airmen's commander, Colonel Benjamin Davis Jr., was forced to return to Washington to fight for the survival of his squadron at a congressional hearing. His testimony successfully countered the critics. The resulting congressional report stated that the 99th Pursuit Squadron was a superb tactical fighting unit. From that point on, the Tuskegee Airmen fought ferociously to escort and protect American bombers. They excelled and proved the doubters wrong. The angels were, were right with us. They just stuck with us. And I remember we were over Vienna and the first time we ever got hit by fighter bombers, we all grabbed our guns and started shooting at them. I didn't care where the gun was going, so long as it was going off. The German fighters had a technique of drawing off fighter escorts and then bringing somebody down to shoot down the bombers. Our record of never losing a bomber to enemy fighters is a unique record in the military history. And the reason for this is uh, Colonel Benjamin Davis and his staunch leadership, which insisted that if we were assigned to escort the bombers, we had to stay with the bombers. They were always on time. They were always with us. If somebody got disabled, somebody would pull over and escort them back to safety. They decided that what the war should be about was infrastructure, that we should bomb the things that made war possible for the enemy. The oil fields were vital to the Luftwaffe and what and the Nazi machine altogether. And the Luftwaffe was, was guarding them with whatever was left that they had. And they put up a tremendous resistance. And these guys went after them uh, with a vengeance. The, they, they really knocked the hell out of the Luftwaffe. As we came over the target, getting ready to bomb the, the uh, Mercedes-Benz tank, plant, which was producing tanks, not automobiles at that time, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed these jets streaking by, and I said, drop your tanks and follow me. So from the rear position, I pulled up, turned upside down, dropped underneath of the bombers, away from the jets, and then made a hard right turn so that I could catch the jet just as he was coming in to shoot down the bomber. I had a good electronic sight. I put my leads on him, I pulled the trigger, boom, hit him right midstream. He parachuted. It was the first kill in the 15th Air Force of a jet. And it happened just like that. Come down under the bombers, away from the jet, then get into the jet, boom, boom, blew it up. In fact, the picture that's behind me is a picture of me shooting down the jet over Berlin on March 24th, 1945. 
they decided to change our airplane. So now people who had flown the P-40 in North Africa and the P-40 at home, suddenly are told you have to fly another airplane. And they put us in what we call the jug, or the P-47 Thunderbolt. Completely different airplane from a little light 39 to an airplane that weighs 16,000 pounds empty. <laughs> Carried eight machine guns, four in each wing. But soon the Germans found out that we couldn't stay with the bombers, B-24s and 17s, all the way there. So they decided again that they would have to have another airplane that could go to distance. And they picked a beautiful airplane called the Mustang P-51. They said, here's your airplane, and this is how you start it, this is how you run it. Patted us on the head and said, go back to Italy. And then we flew back to Italy, the next day we fly a mission. No, back to the States for three months, five months for training. No, intense in a combat zone. Fight. And they did it. If we fail, then the bigots and the naysayers and so forth would be able to say, we told you they couldn't do it, and they failed, so just go away, don't bother us anymore. We knew that if we failed, that uh, the people were going to go back to this study that was done in 1925 and said, we told you they couldn't do it. So everybody who came into that program knew that we just don't fail, don't fail. We did our best and some of them made it big time. 450 Tuskegee Airmen in Europe flew more than 1,500 missions, destroyed 111 aircraft in the air, 150 on the ground, 40 boats and barges, 600 trains, and two oil and ammunition dumps. Collectively, they received 95 distinguished flying crosses, 14 bronze stars, and 744 air medals and clusters. But what meant the most to the airmen happened after the war. President Harry S. Truman, FDR's vice president, who assumed the presidency when FDR died mid-term in 1945, signed into law Executive Order Number 9981, making segregation in the armed forces illegal. In the end, it's said that the Tuskegee Airmen won two great victories. One against German fascism and the other against racism back home. I have been asked, well, why would you fight so hard for a country that treated you and your people so harshly? I really had to think about it and I've come up with an answer that satisfies me and I really believe it. When the pilgrims first came to this continent, among the pilgrims there were women. It wasn't until 300 years later, the day before the year before I born, that women got the right to vote. So at that point, this, the people of this country demonstrated their ability to change. There was a time that lynching black people was a, a festival. You don't do that anymore. It's against the law. The, the people of this country finally got to the point where they say, that's inhuman and we don't go along. So they voted against it with the anti-lynching law. There was a time when the armed forces were segregated. Not anymore. There has never been another country whose people have shown an ability to change, like us.
am a senior here at Tuskegee University, majoring in aerospace engineering. I also fly airplanes out at Moton Field. When I, when I started flying, I noticed that one of the pictures on the wall were actually, was actually the plane of the plane that I was flying. And that turned out to be Chief Anderson's old plane. So that, that was the plane that I got my pilot's license in. So that was, that was, that was something else for me. <laughs> that was the experience in itself. I have the ambition to one day own my own flight school. And, and I also want to own my own charter airlines. So that's, that's something that I want to do. And of course, it'll have something but the Tuskegee Airmen <laughs> related to it. Maybe a little tip of a red tail or something. I don't know. on my right. I turn right and put up a stone wall of bullets. Hello, folks. Welcome to Clinton Historical Society February meeting. Uh, we're tonight honoring Black History Month, and we have with us uh, Gregory Edmonds, who is president of the Memorial Chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, and Gregory's located out in central Ohio. So he's coming to us from there. Gregory is currently a self-employed as an insurance consultant, arbitrator, appraiser, and mediator uh, with the Edmonds Group LLC. He retired from Westfield uh, Insurance Company as a regional property specialist in January 2018. Gregory was born and raised in the Garden State of New Jersey. He obtained a BA degree in history in 1974 from Seton Hall in South Orange, New Jersey. His college thesis paper on the history of black cowboys, that's what it was. His junior year paper was on the history of Buffalo soldiers. Uh, Gregory has lived in the Columbus, Ohio area the past 17 years. His bride, of 47 years, Maxine, is a retired elementary school teacher who continues to tutor un underprivileged kids. They have a son, Jamil, who is a general, the general manager of a successful Honda dealership in Northern Virginia. 
They both volunteer to help out the homeless in the Columbus, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, at St. John's United Church of Christ and St. Philip's Episcopal Church. Gregory is a James Bond movie fan, and his hobbies include tennis, golf, bicycling, and fencing. He also enjoys playing the bow psaltery instrument. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He currently uh, proudly serves as the president of the Ohio Memorial Chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, which covers central Ohio. He's a volunteer also at the National Veterans Memorial in, and Museum in Ohio. So please welcome Gregory Edmonds. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, and I, I'm sure, I hope you, uh, everyone enjoyed the film that uh, you have seen on the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, the only thing is we will make the correction that they did lose the bombers in, during the battle, but they still had an exemplary record uh, amongst all, all, of the, uh, uh, all of the groups. So we're still proud of that. So I want to uh, go into my PowerPoint slide uh, presentation to show you some enhancements to the film to give you some more uh, insight and uh, so that you can make up, uh, make up your own minds further about the group. Um, and we'll start in one second. Okay, uh, I like to always um, talk about uh, the people whose shoulders the Tuskegee Airmen stand on. And the first one of note is uh, Bessie Coleman. Uh, she was um, born in January 26, 1892 to a family of sharecroppers in Texas. And Bessie was the first African and Native American to obtain an international pilot's license from France's Aviation Federation on July 15, 1921. She worked as a child in the cotton fields in Texas. She attended, I, yes. You need to share your screen. Oh, we're not I'm seeing, sorry. we're not seeing okay. your screen. That's okay. Yeah, just go uh, ahead. Wait a minute. My bad. Uh, wait a minute. Okay. Let me, let's do this. I forgot to do that. Now, do you want to, do you want me to start over? Um, I could start over. Okay. All right. Go Just ahead. Put the recording over. Okay? Cut it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm so used to being on one side of it <laughs> to the other side. That's just, uh, okay. All right. Now let me stop share now until I get into, uh, all right. Okay. So now just let me know you're ready to start. Go ahead. Again. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Hi, this is Gregory Edmonds and thank you for that introduction, Barbara. Uh, it's an honor to, uh, represent the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, hopefully that, uh, you got a lot out of the film. I do want to make a correction that the uh, 332nd Fighter Group did lose bombers in action uh, during their escort missions, but they still had an exemplary record over and above uh, all the other groups. So uh, with that in mind, I want to uh, continue to give you additional perspective on their story by showing you uh, a PowerPoint presentation uh, that hopefully will enhance your knowledge of them. So I will now go to the share screen and let's see, hold on a second. Get back this up. Boom. All right. Second, now we'll go to share screen and okay. All right, is that, uh, hopefully that can be seen. All right, and okay. The first one of note here being shown is uh, Bessie Coleman. 
And Bessie Coleman was born on January 26th, 1892, and she was born to a family of sharecroppers in Texas. She was the first African and Native American to obtain an international pilot's license from France's Aviation Federation on July 15, 1921. She worked as a child in the cotton fields in Texas. She attended one term of college at Langston University, which is an historical black college. She developed an early interest in flying, but faced discrimination and denial of opportunity here in the United States. She then decided to save her money and obtain sponsorships to go to France for flight school. When she returned to the United States, she became a high profile stunt pilot in dangerous air shows. She became popularly known as Queen Bess and there's a book out on her life of that title. And she was also known as Brave Bessie. She's, <clears throat> she started a school for African-American flyers in Illinois but however, she died tragically in a stunt plane crash in 1926 and was buried in Lincoln Cemetery in Cook County, Illinois. A public library in Chicago was named after her as are roads at O'Hare International Airport, Oakland International Airport in California, Tampa International Airport, and Frankfurt, uh, Germany International Airport. Bessie Coleman Middle School, in Cedar Hill, Texas, and a boulevard in Waxahachie, Texas, is also named for her. The United States Postal Service issued a stamp honoring her in 1995. She was inducted into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame at San Diego Air and Space Museum in the year 2014. Next, we have uh, Willa Brown. On, uh, she was born on January 22nd, 1906, and she was an American aviator, lobbyist, teacher, and civil rights activist. She was the first African-American woman to earn both a pilot's and mechanic's license in the United States. The first African-American woman also to run for Congress. Many people uh, think it was Shirley Chisholm, but Shirley was the first to be elected. Will was the first to run out of Illinois. Uh, she also became the first African-American officer in the Civil Air Patrol. She was a lifelong advocate for gender and racial equality in the field of aviation, as well as in the military. She not only lobbied the United States government to integrate the U.S. Army Air Corps and include African-Americans in the civilian pilot training program, she and Cornelius Coffey co-founded the Coffey School of Aeronautics which became the first private flight training academy owned and operated by African-Americans in the United States. She trained hundreds of pilots in the 1930s, several of whom went on to become Tuskegee Airmen. Their creation has been credited to her efforts. Brown remained politically and socially active in Chicago after the coffee school closed in 1945. She ran in congressional primary elections in 1946 and 1950 and taught in the Chicago public school system until 1971 when she retired at age 65. Following her retirement, she served on the Federal Aviation Administration's Women Advisory Committee until 1974. She died in 1992 at age 86. Next, we have uh, Captain Stephanie Johnson. Uh, she, was the she became the first uh, African-American uh, female pilot for Delta Airlines, where she still flies with uh, out of uh, Detroit, Michigan. And this is another legacy to Bessie Coleman and Willa Brown. This is Madeline Swagel, who became the United States Navy's first black female pilot recently. Now, this is Eugene Buller. He was born on October 9th, 1895, and he was born in Columbus, Georgia, the seventh of 10 children. He was the first African-American military pilot, although due to discrimination, he had to fly for France. He was one of the few black combat pilots during World War I. He um, was also a boxer and a jazz musician, and he was called the Black Swallow. 
During his youth in Georgia, he suffered the trauma of watching a white mob attempt to lynch his father over a workplace dispute. However, his father continued to voice the conviction that African Americans had to maintain their dignity and self-respect in the face of white prejudice. Despite this, Eugene became enamored with his dad's stories of France, where slavery had been abolished and Blacks were treated the same as whites. In 1912, he stowed away in a German freighter and after arriving in Scotland, eventually made his way uh, to Paris, where he decided to settle. And he became a boxer and worked in a music hall until the start of World War I. When World War I began in August of 1914, Bullard enlisted and was assigned to the French Foreign Legion. By 1915, he was a machine gunner. He eventually transferred and while serving with the 170th Infantry in March 1916, he was seriously wounded at the Battle of Verdun. While recuperating, he learned to fly on a bet. After recovering, he volunteered on October 2nd, 1916 for the French Air Service as an air gunner. He was later accepted and underwent initial flight training and received his pilot's license from Air Club of France on, uh, on May 5, 1917. He hoped to, but was not able to join the famous Lafayette Escadrille due to restriction on its number of pilots. But he did join the 269 American aviators of the Lafayette Flying Corps on November 15, 1916. He flew out of Verdun and took part in over 20 combat missions and is sometimes credited with shooting down one or two German aircraft. When the United States entered the war, the United States Army Air Corps convened a medical board to recruit Americans serving in the Lafayette Flying Corps. <clears throat> now Bullard went through the medical exam, but he was not accepted as only white pilots were chosen. He eventually ended up back with the French 170th Infantry. Uh, he served beyond the armistice, which ended the war, and he was not discharged until October 24th, 1919. For his service, the French government awarded Bullard the Croix de Guerre, along with 14 French war medals. After his discharge, he returned to Paris, where he went into the music and nightclub business. When World War II began in 1939, he agreed to a request from the French government to spy on the Germans who frequented his nightclub. It sounds like Casablanca, doesn't it? Following the German invasion of uh, France in 1940, Bullard volunteered and served with the 51st Infantry Regiment in defending Orleans, France on June 15, 1940. He was wounded but escaped to neutral Spain and in 1940, uh, July of 1940, he returned to the United States where he worked as a perfume salesman, security guard, and an interpreter for Louis Armstrong. He eventually bought an apartment in Harlem from a financial settlement he received uh, from the French government when his nightclub, uh, his Paris nightclub had burned down. In the 1950s, he was a relative stranger in the United States and lived alone in his apartment. After his children uh, from a prior marriage had grown up, uh, his final job was as an elevator operator at the Rockefeller Center. On December 22nd, in 1959, he was interviewed by NBC's Dave Garraway. I'm sure many of you remember the Today Show. Uh, Garraway interviewed him about his life while he was still wearing his elevator operator uniform. After that interview, he received hundreds of letters uh, from viewers. He died in 1961 from cancer at the age of 66 and was buried with military honors in the French Veterans Section of Flushing Cemetery in New York City. His friend Louis Armstrong is buried in the same cemetery. He also received other numerous awards, including a statue back in his uh, Columbus, Georgia uh, hometown. This is the HBO movie uh, that was made uh, in 1995. Uh, George Lucas, you know, you're familiar with him, the uh, prolific uh, producer uh, of the Star Wars movies and the Indiana Jones movies. Uh, he always had the rights to make the story of the Tuskegee Airmen, the, the uh, film rights, but it always sat on the shelf, always making that, uh, those films, those other films, until HBO approached and asked for permission to make a limited film about the group, which they did, like, as I said, in, eight, in 1995. Now, this film shows the training experience of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, the next film that came out 
it was in 2012, and that was George Lucas himself. Uh, and then he finally got it off his shelf and he made the red tips. And typical George Lucas, it does not show the training experience because it just shows them getting right into action, strafing the trains and shooting this down and that down. So that's, that's typical George Lucas. Let's get at it. Let's get at it. So it was very, very well received, though, and I highly recommend that one as well. This is a typical poster from uh, World War II. And this is the P-51C escorting uh, B-17 bombers, as is shown in my background as well. This is their, a group of them at Ramatelli, Ramatelli Italy Airfield. And uh, this is another group of pilots at the same airfield. There is a, uh, a gentleman now, the airfield is pretty much in ruins now. But there is a, an Italian gentleman who's in the process of raising funds to get it restored. It's a planning meeting. Now this is the P-51C aircraft because you can tell that because it's got a square shaped canopy. This is the P-51D which came afterwards and you can tell the difference because it has a bubble top which gave them better visibility. So that was used later in the war. Again, this is the 51C. Now this is a P-51C owned by the Commemorative Air Force. They're out of uh, Minneapolis. We, I took this picture while at the Dayton, Ohio air show. Again, now this is Benjamin, as you know, Carol, Colonel Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Um, he was born on December 18, 1912, and he was the first Black Brigadier General in the United States Air Force. Uh, he was born in Washington, D.C., and he was the second of three children born to Benjamin O. Davis Sr. and Elnora Dickerson Davis. His father was a U.S. Army officer, and at the time, he was stationed in Wyoming serving as a lieutenant with an all-white cavalry unit. Benjamin O. Davis Sr., served 41 years before he was promoted Brigadier General in October 1940. So actually his dad became the first Brigadier General African-American. Elnora Davis, his mom died from complications after giving birth to their third child, Elnora, in 1916. At the age of 13 in the summer of 1926, Davis Jr. went for a flight with a barnstorming pilot at Bowling Field in Washington, D.C. The experience led to his determination to become a pilot himself. In 1929, at the beginning of the Great Depression, Davis graduated from Central High School in Cleveland, Ohio. That same year, he attended Western Reserve University in uh, Cleveland. After attending the University of France and then Chicago, he entered the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York in July 1932. He graduated from West Point in 1936 and became the first African-American male to graduate from the school since 1889. Now, unfortunately, he went through four years of his, uh, while he was going through the four years of his term in West Point, he was racially isolated by his white classmates. Few of them spoke to him outside of the line of duty. He never had a roommate and he ate by himself. His classmates hoped that this would drive him out of the academy, but the silent treatment had the opposite effect. It made Davis more determined to graduate. Nevertheless, he earned the respect of his classmates as evidenced by the biographical note beneath his picture in the 1936 yearbook, The Howitzer, which said, the courage, tenacity, and intelligence with which he conquered a problem incomparably more difficult than plebe year won for him the sincere admiration of his classmates and his single-minded determination to continue in his chosen career, which cannot fail to inspire respect wherever fortune may lead him. He graduated in June 1936, 35th in the class of 276. <clears throat> and in 1937, he attended U.S. Army Infantry School at Fort Benning. He was later assigned to teach military tactics at Tuskegee Institute, a historically black college in Tuskegee, Alabama. 
This was something his father had done years before as a way for the army to avoid having a black officer in command of white soldiers. Colonel Benjamin Oliver Davis Jr. of Washington, D.C. climbed into an advanced trainer at Tuskegee, Alabama in January 1942. Early in 1941, when the uh, response from the Roosevelt administration and the public for greater black participation in the military as World War II approached, the War Department then created the units that you saw in the film. And so Davis, uh, in that year, having been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, he was named commander of the first all black air unit, the 99th Pursuit Squadron. In 1943, Davis was deployed to the United States after he had a successful uh, career overseas in Africa commanding them. So then after he took command of the 332nd Fighter Group, uh, the senior officers uh, eventually got a lot of respect for him. However, it took a long time. You know, and he had to, in fact, go to bat for them on many occasions in order to get them to be allowed to go up in the air and to escort the enemy, uh, to escort the bombers against enemy fire. <clears throat> Colonel Davis uh, it, it was eventually uh, commanded uh, to, uh, of, of the 332nd Fighter Group to fly more than 15,000 sorties where they shot down 112 enemy planes. They also destroyed and or damaged 273 on the ground and lost 66 of their own planes. And they only lost about 25 bombers. So Davis himself led 67 missions in P P-47s and P-51 Mustangs. He received the Silver Star for a strafing run into Austria and the Distinguished Flying Cross for a bomber escort mission to Munich on June 9th, 1944. And this is uh, Davis. Uh, at the time, he was a Brigadier General. He did not receive his fourth star until after he retired. And that was from, uh, uh, that was during the uh, presidency of uh, Bill Clinton. Daniel Chappie James Jr. became the first four star African American general. And he's here, he is in the Air Force. Uh, he was, he instructed Tuskegee Airmen pilots during World War II because he was too big to fit in a P-51 small cockpit. So he had to wait, but he did instruct them. So he, uh, he did fly his fighter jets as well during the Korean War. And he was inducted into the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 1993. He commanded the uh, Wheelis Air Force Base in Libya in the wake of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi's coup. Lockbourne Air Force Base was in Columbus, Ohio, was the last air base of the Tuskegee Airmen when President Truman signed Executive Order 9981, to, which desegregated the military. Now, Lockbourne is now called, again, Rickenbacker, and it's about 20 minutes southwest of Columbus. <clears throat> this is an aerial view of Lockbourne Air Force Base, now called Rickenbacker. And this is these was this air this picture was taken in the 1940s. And you can see this is Tuskegee Airman Alex Boudreau, born in 1920 and passed away in 2011. He was also a member of my Ohio Memorial Chapter. Uh, he was a pilot, uh, Tuskegee Airman pilot, who in 1946, after the war ended, was appointed as the first African American air traffic control in the United States at Port Columbus, Ohio. It is now called John Glenn International Airport. He remained there after his appointment until his retirement in 1977. <clears throat> He's also the founding member of the Ohio Museum of Flight in Port Columbus, and he was inducted into the Veterans Hall of Fame in 2005, and he's a charter member of the Mott's Military Museum in Groveport, Ohio. This is uh, Harold Brown, uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired, who's also a member of my Ohio Memorial Chapter, and, and he flew with the 99th Fighter Squadron. He was recently honored by the Ford Oval Group on November 14th, 2021 at the National Veterans Memorial and Museum. This is his book, Keep Your Airspeed Up, 
the story of a Tuskegee Airman. And um, Harold Brown, uh, it, he's not, like I say, he's 97 right now. And uh, he still gets around making speaking engagements with his wife, Dr. Marsha Borden. And this is Harold with a model of his P-51C uh, plane. Now, the early pilots were allowed to name their planes, but not the pilots who came later. Don't know why. This is the um, uh, affair that was held for Harold Brown uh, on November 14, 2021 at the National Veterans Memorial Museum in Columbus. And as this is myself wearing his uh, Converse, the Converse sneakers that were made in tribute for his plane. With us is uh, four-star retired General Marianne Miller of the Air Force. And not many women get the four stars. She was the keynote speaker, did an excellent job. This again is Alex Boudreau with other past, uh, he's passed away, but with other members of our Ohio Memorial chapter. This is Tuskegee Airman uh, pilot Lee Archer. And Lee Archer, uh, was considered the first ace of the Tuskegee Airmen. You know, with an ace, you have to shoot down at least four planes. So he was part of a group of six pilots of the 332nd Fighter Group uh, who shot down three German ME-109s during one mission. This is his plane. It's called the Ina the Macon Bell. See, so he's one of the early pilots who was allowed to name their plane. Now he and Captain Wendell Pruitt, uh, who flew his who flew his plane called Alice Joe, they shot down an HE-111 and an ME-109 during the same mission from Budapest to Bratislava, and so those two earned the nickname the Gruesome Twosome. This is a P-51C plane of the Commemorative Air Force with Air, Air Force trainer jet the T-7A Red Hawk that was put together in tribute to the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. This is Tuskegee Airmen Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Jefferson, who went the 99th. Uh, he served in the military from 1942 to 1969. And during his 19th mission over Toulon, France on August 12, 1944, he was shot down while attacking a radar installation. Parachuting to safety, he was immediately captured by Nazi ground troops and was a POW at a Stalag in Poland. This was a specialist Luftwaffe run camp that served as the model for the TV show Hogan's Heroes. He said he was treated like any other Air Force officer. He was then transferred to a Stalag near Dachau. After the Russian army entered Poland, the POWs were marched to Munich by the Germans, where they were freed by General Patton's Third Army. Alexander Jefferson was one of my mentors when I joined the Detroit chapter in 1995. He recently turned 100 on November 15, 2021, and is still kicking. By the way, um, uh, Harold Brown, whom I mentioned earlier, he was also shot down, and he was also a POW who was later also liberated. Uh, by uh, Patton, Patton's Third Army. And this is Alexander Jefferson's book, Red Tail Captured, Red Tail Free, which I highly recommend you get. It's a wonderful book. So he's still up there in Detroit, Michigan. And this is Jeff. We call him Jeff. This is one of the kids at one of the air shows a couple of years ago. Now, this is uh, Brigadier General Charles McGee who recently passed away on January uh, 16th of this year and uh, at the ripe old age of 102. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio. And as a child, he was a member of the Boy Scouts of America and achieved its highest rank of Eagle Scout in 1940. At the 2010 National Scout Jamboree, he was honored with the Distinguished Scout Award. He enlisted with the US Army while attending the University of Illinois in 1942. He became part of the Tuskegee Airmen and earned his pilot's wings when he graduated from class 43F on June 30th, 1943. 
He was assigned to the 302nd Fighter Squadron, which flew with the 332nd Fighter Group, flying his first mission on Valentine's Day. How poetic. On August 23, 1944, while escorting B-17s over Czechoslovakia, McGee engaged a formation of Luftwaffe fighters and shot down a Folk Wolf FW-190. Now a captain, McGee had flown 137 missions and was returned to the United States on December 1st, 1944 to become an instructor for the North American B-25 Mitchell bombers flown by the 477th Bomber Group a unit of <clears throat> Tuskegee Airmen which never saw combat. After the war, he was assigned to Lockbourne Air Force Base in Lockbourne, Ohio to become the base operations and training officer in 1948. Continuing his service with the now United States Air Force, uh, McGee continued to serve as a fighter pilot flying Lockheed F-80 and other aircraft. When the Korean War broke out, he flew a P-51 Mustangs again in the 67th Fighter Bomber Squadron, completing 100 combat missions and was promoted to major. During the Vietnam War, as a Lieutenant Colonel, McGee flew combat missions in a McDonnell RF-4 photo reconnaissance aircraft. During a Southeast Asia combat tour, McGee served as the squadron commander of the 16th Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron of the 460th Tactical Reconnaissance Wing. After a series of other appointments here, as well as in Italy and West Germany, McGee retired as Lieutenant Colonel on January 31st, 1973. McGee holds the, the never will be broken combat flight record of 409 hours covering World War II, Korea and Vietnam. He ended his military career with 6,308 flying hours. In 1978, at age 58, he completed his college degree at Columbia College. Getting a degree had been a lifelong goal of his. In February 2020, McGee presented the coin for a coin flip at Super Bowl 54, alongside three other fellow cent centenarian World War II veterans. Two days later, he was honored in person at the 2020 State of the Union address by the president with a promotion to Brigadier General. M Brigadier General McGee died in his sleep on January 16, 2022 at the age of 102. His, he had many, many awards during his career, but he also stressed, he also he always stressed about getting an education. Getting an education, getting an education. That was a big, big deal. And he was also proud, as I said before, of, of the Scout Oath and Law, which he could recite from memory. It just, it did, it, at the age of 99 even, it was an amazing, amazing man. We were honored to uh, have him here at Columbus in uh, April 23rd, 2019. Pictured with him is uh, Codebreaker John Bergman, who's still kicking at 102 here in Upper Arlington, Ohio, which is a suburb of Columbus. And so at the time these, this picture was taken, the two, remember, were both 99 years young. So uh, Bergman, uh, uh, FDR, flew uh, these Codebreakers around the world to, uh, as I said, break German and Japanese codes. And FDR did it at his own expense to keep them off the books, to keep them a secret. So um, he still drives too. Amazing, another amazing man. Just, just amazing to be in their presence. We had uh, General McGee on stage, and as you can see, surrounded with the Boy Scouts. And here he is reciting the Scout Oath and Law. Didn't miss a word. Didn't miss a word. Just a remarkable man. Here he is signing our chapter car, which is a 1965 Dodge Dart at the King Arts Complex here in Columbus. These are the sneakers that were made in tribute to his plane he called Kitten. I have those too. And I was able to send the pair to him, which he signed and sent back. So I just keep those in the box. I don't wear those. That is for display only. This is our chapter car. It said the 65 Dodge Dart and planes come out the tailpipes. We take them around different air shows. Gets a lot of attention as you can imagine. This is another one of our still living uh, documented original Tuskegee Airmen in our chapter. This is Don Elder. He's with historic impressionist Anthony Gibbs who's with the Ohio History Connection here in Columbus. This was taken in um, 2021. Yes, yeah, January 20 at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. 
This is Mal Whitfield. Um, he was um, Tuske Tuskegee Airman, and he was also a track star at Ohio State University. And this is uh, when we that they dedicated the track to uh, Mal Whitfield at Rickenbacker Air Force Base uh, back in 2019. And this is Don Elder standing next to the plaque. Mal Whitfield was the first uh, active duty serviceman to uh, earn an Olympic medal. And these are the part, one of the, the dignitaries at the track and field, including the mayor of Lockbourne, uh, who's there. Wonderful event. Now, as part of our mission, we also go around our chapter. We believe in education. And so we do go around and speak to youth groups and particularly to the schools. This is one of the Columbus uh, City Preparatory School for Boys. And we also give, until COVID came, we'd always give a Christmas gale at the airport Marriott. And this is uh, retired, general, uh, retired uh, Colonel uh, Holly Mitchell. Now, when we do uh, have clinics for children, we, also, we show them how to operate a drone, which is where the arrow is here and how to fly it. We try to expose them to careers in aerospace. These are the flying hobos. These are actors portraying the flying hobos who were two African-American men who flew, uh, who had a transcontinental journey from Los Angeles to New York in the 1930s, and they stopped in Columbus. And these gentlemen here are active pilots right here on their front and flanks. They're all members of uh, my chapter. This is the National Veterans Memorial Museum uh, in uh, Columbus at the Scioto River, which opened in October of 2018. This was the vision of uh, then Senator John Glenn. And this is about the spoken word of the veterans. So anybody who comes through Columbus, I encourage you to uh, visit. I'm an active volunteer there, and that's my home away from home, the home of the brave. Uh, during uh, their first members only uh, session uh, at the Veterans Museum, uh, they asked me, I was very honored to do a presentation on the Tuskegee Airmen. So this is uh, Anthony Gibbs with me. And this is uh, a retired uh, Colonel uh, Bill Butler, who is the Chief of Staff at the Veterans Museum. This is Mr. Harold Wesley, the late Mr. Harold Wesley, who was a bomber crewman. And he became a member of our chapter when he was so grateful for the Tuskegee Airmen uh, saving his life uh, as a bomber crew member during World War II, he said, hey, can I join you guys? And we said, sure, why not? So we had him and he passed away a few years ago and we did not know that he was a millionaire, <laughs> a millionaire, because he was so humble. He didn't, he, he didn't, didn't act or anything like that. You'd never know it, never know it, very nice. This is a tribute to the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Uh, by the United States Air Force Academy football team in 2020. This is a tribute to the 100th Fighter uh, Squadron by the Alabama Air National Guard at the Dayton Air Show in 2019. Just so you understand, the uh, Tuskegee Airmen were formed into four fighter squadrons, the 99th, the 100th, the 301st, and 302nd. There are 16 planes that make a fighter squadron. Four squadrons make a fighter group. And so they were then put into the 15th Air Force. This is a good book I ref that would be good for you to get if you want to find out more about the Tuskegee Airmen. It's a good resource book. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. This is, uh, we go around to air shows and with our merchandise. This is at the Dayton Air Show. We set up our booth with the t-shirts and the hats and the coins and all that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the Lockbourne being their last air base, this is the, um, they dedicated their uh, cafeteria part of the base to uh, being renamed the Red Tail Angels Dining Facility in June of 1998. And we have our own meeting room in there. And this is the meeting room. This is what it looks like. We meet there every other month. This municipal field, uh, Moton Field, I should say, uh, which is the home of the Tuskegee Airmen in Alabama, where they trained. And while they were going through their training, they were not allowed to fly over the uh, town of Tuskegee because the citizens said, we don't want to look up at you. And that's something your own country. 
The National Museum of Tuskegee Airmen is located in the Charles Wright Museum of African American History uh, in Detroit, Michigan. It did have its own standalone house, which was created by then Mayor Coleman Young, who was a bomber pilot and, and uh, trained with the 477th. Uh, I also encourage you to look up the Freeman Field incident where uh, Tuskegee Airmen officers were court-martialed when they tried to enter a whites-only officers club. And their records though were later expunged in 1994 by then Togo West, Secretary of the Army under President Bill Clinton. However, Mayor Coleman Young, who was one of the bomber pilots, said that he did not want his record expunged. He wanted that stain to remain so as not to blot out history and what happened. This is another tribute to the Red Tails with this Mustang. This is my one of my trade tables that this lady made up for me. This is the Red Tails uh, community garden in the driving park community. When the uh, Lockbourne being their last air base, when, the, uh, when the, the, everything desegregated, uh, many of the Tuskegee Airmen settled in the Columbus area. So we had this garden made in tribute to them with the double V, double victory. This is the congressional gold medal they received on March 29, 2007 from uh, President George W. Bush. The Ohio legislature passed March 29th to be designated Tuskegee Airmen Day in Ohio which we will celebrate this year at the National Veterans Memorial and Museum. And of course, always giving tribute to our ladies of strength during the war. They served in all capacities as well, including the Tuskegee Army nurses who served with the Airmen at Lockbourne during World War II. One of the, this lady here, um, her daughter, Pia Jordan was one of our keynote speakers. Pia lives in uh, Tampa and she's right now going uh, going around the country, raising funds to uh, do a documentary on them. This is them in uniform. They were all either second or first lieutenants. And don't they look sharp? And again, this is Tuskegee Airmen Day. And this is a quarter that was issued in uh, February of last year by the United States Mint that is in circulation. And again, this is a mission of our uh, Tuskegee Airmen chapter to, again, to inform youth. So every year we have the Buckeye Tigers. This is, this is the class of 2019, a group of boys and girls. Uh, this is a group of 25. Last year it was 14 due to COVID. But we meet at Rickenbacker Woods House. This is the house of Eddie Rickenbacker. This is the original house that they turned. This has been, a, it's been donated to a foundation. So it's used as a community house. And this is the class of 2020 last year at uh, the, with the 450, 445th Air Wing at Wright Air, Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, as you can see, they are a great group. They love having the boys and girls there. We take them around to different places like this, plus uh, John Glenn International Airport. Uh, and uh, we also at the graduation let them fly co-pilot, I should say, a single wind aircraft. So their ages range from 12 to 15, and they come from all over. All of these fellows are pilots, all of them. And they love having the kids. They, they, they love speaking to the kids, take them into the aircraft, cargo, and schooling them on careers in aerospace. Not many people hear about aerospace careers. You don't hear about that. And like I said, the future of America is our youth. And I want to conclude by reading this poem called Thinking by Walter Wintel, which is kind of the basis for the Tuskegee Airmen and their thought process and how they overcame and flew over discrimination. It goes, if you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it is almost certain you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost. For out in the world we find, success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you are outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win a prize. Life's battles don't always go 
to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the man who wins is the one who thinks he can. Thank you. My name's Barbara Sweet, and I'm the program chairman for Clinton Historical Society, and welcome, folks. Uh, tonight, we have um, one interesting speaker here from Dutchess County, exactly. Um, Elizabeth Betsy Strauss is an active member of the Amenia Historical Society, where she maintains the archives, assists with program planning, and responds to specific requests for genealogical and historical information. Betsy also serves on the Dutchess County Historical Society Board of Trustees, where she has recently contributed articles for publication in the yearbook and has presented programs of historical interest. So Betsy, welcome. Thank you. I, uh, I want to thank Gregory for his great presentation. And uh, thank you, Barbara and Cynthia and Kathy for allowing me a few minutes to uh, mention uh, something that I think is important. But also I wanted to say how wonderful the video was at the beginning. And uh, it just, it, uh, I learned so much. Um, I, I want to let the people of Dutchess County know that uh, a former Poughkeepsie resident um, was a Tuskegee Airman, and his name was Harold May. Uh, his nickname was Hal. He Harold, Harold May graduated from Poughkeepsie High School in January of 1944, and he started college at Harvard just a few months later. At that time, Hal's father, Reverend Arthur May, was the beloved minister at the AME Zion Church in Poughkeepsie, where he served for at least 15 years. Hal's brother, Arthur S. May, became a, an educator in Poughkeepsie and was honored for his contribution some years later as um, an educator by having a school named after him in Arlington, the Arthur S. May uh, Elementary School, I think it is. In 1945, before the, the war ended, Hal May enlisted in the Army Air Corps. He wanted to fly airplanes and found his way to Tuskegee for training. But because of eye problems and the need for an eye operation, Hal did not see action as an airman. He went through the training and later returned to Harvard to attend medical school. My husband, Julian Strauss, and I met Hal May, Dr. Hal May, in uh, Haiti at the hospital Albert Schweitzer, where he was the chief of surgery. Dr. May wanted to help the Haitian people medically, but he also wanted to provide an education for the Haitian children in the hospital district. This goal was achieved over the next several years. Dr. Harold May is living in Boston area with his wife, Agnes. His three daughters live nearby. Hal has dedicated his long life to serving others through the advancement of medicine and education in Haiti and in Boston. Information about his work can be found online in at least three different articles. If you just Google his name, Dr. Harold May, uh, his interview with the Harvard Library, as well as um, his um, write-up with the, the uh, with the Tuskegee Airmen of that area in 2006, and a third article was for Who's Who in America. So I just wanted to share that with you, and I thank you very much uh, for allowing me to do that. Good night. 